As we've been saying the last couple of weeks, words are powerful. Words are really, really powerful, and that can be in a good way, in an uplifting way, in an edifying way, or words can be powerful in a very negative and harmful way. Um, I came across this quote, words create worlds. That's so good. I, I think that's so true. That's from Abraham Joshua Heschel. I think a lot of people have said that, but we're going to give him credit for it today because he was the one that I saw first that said it. Words create worlds. Now, biblically speaking, we see this, right? Where, where do we see that in the Bible? What chapter? Genesis chapter 1, the very first chapter, we see that words create worlds. And this world, as we know it, was spoken into existence. Now, here's a little bit of fun Bible trivia. Who spoke the world into existence or who created the world? God. Everybody says God. Can we be more specific? This, okay, we've got some conflicting answers here. I like this. This is good. So it says, in the beginning... God created the heaven and the earth. So we know it was God, but I think we can be a little bit more specific. Um, if you've got your Bible real quick, we're going to look at two verses, Colossians chapter 1. Now, as a pastor, this really has nothing to do with the sermon, but every time I get the opportunity to say this out loud, I'm going to, and I want to teach this to you guys. Because as you're having discussions with people who have different faith systems and different beliefs, this is probably going to come up. And I want your arsenal to be full of tools in a way of, of apologetics, of being able to defend your faith and say, no, 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 that's not what Scripture says. This is what Scripture says. So Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, it says, the Son, which is who? Jesus, right? Jesus, all right? The Son is the image of the invisible God. So there right there is saying Jesus is God. He is the image of the invisible God. He's the God that we can see. He's the God that came here to this earth. Three parts, one God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. All three of them fully God. Everybody still tracking with me? All right, cool. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Now, this is where they get all tangled up. Firstborn does not mean he was born of God. I believe the word is protokos, okay? It just means the preeminent one. It doesn't mean Jesus was born from God. That's not what that means. Don't let anybody tell you differently. Now, here's where we get into it. Verse 16, for in him, what? Okay, so we're talking about Jesus right? The Son, the preeminent one, for in him, in Jesus, all things were created. What people will try to do is put one word in there that changes everything. They will put, and we've gone over this before, but again, I'm going to say it as many times as I possibly can. They put in there, for in him, all other things were created. That one word means Jesus was created because God created Jesus, they would try to say. What just happened there? You de-escalated Jesus just, uh, and they would say, okay, yeah, God, God is, is most important. And then right under God is Jesus. Jesus is super important, but he's not God. He's, he's just right there. False. False Jesus False Christ, false Messiah, that is not a saving Jesus. A created Jesus cannot save you. Jesus was not created. Jesus is God. You can tell them, look it up in the original Greek. And they would say, oh, yeah, yeah, no, no, this is a translated. Look, it's in the Bible. And they will show you their version of the Bible. And say, look, it's right there, all other things. And no Greek scholar worth their salt will admit and say that that word other is in there. It isn't. So never, ever, ever let anybody lower Jesus, even if it's just below God. That is not a saving Jesus. So 
Who created the world? Who spoke the world into existence? Jesus did. More specifically, Jesus. So, all right, so now that we got that out of the way, Genesis chapter 1, here's just a, a few of the examples. Genesis 1, 3. And God said, what's the first one? Let there be light. And there was light. And, and, and then verse 6, it says, and God said... Let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. And then verse 9, verse 11, verse 14, verse 20, and verse 24, all and God said. Words are powerful. Words create worlds. And then you drop down to verse 26. It changes a little bit. He's creating things. Now he gets... Pretty specific, verse 26. Then God said, let us, which there is a whole nother thing right there. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That's the us, three in one. Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. Can you pull this down just a little bit, David, my mic? Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. So there you go. Jesus was there for creation. And then verse 29, it changes again. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, they will be yours for food. So God goes from declaring creation to declaring instruction. So he's instructing them. He says, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, they will be yours for food. Now, my, my vegetarian friends out there, this is your verse, okay? Like, <clears throat> I'm not knocking vegetarians. I am a huge fan of vegetarians. If, if that's what you want to do, that is absolutely amazing. I commend you. And by the way, more vegetarians means more meat for me. Okay, and I, I got some amens in there too. But listen, wherever you fall on that, that's totally okay. Now, for you carnivores out there, like myself, you're wondering, okay, are we only supposed to eat plants? Well, if you go over to chapter 9, this is after the fall and after some other things happen, God says this, everything that lives and moves about will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. And then he does put some conditions and some things on there. But for us carnivores, there's our verse right there. The vegetarians got their verse. Awesome. God bless you guys. More meat for us, right? So God spoke all these things into existence. Words create worlds. Now, I'm very grateful for Abraham Joshua Heschel for coming up with that. Words create worlds. But I, I think for where we're going today, I want to change it just a little bit. Here, here's my version of it. Your words create your world around you. Your words, the words that come out of your mouth, they create this entire world around you. And oftentimes, we can look at our lives and our lives are just chaos. Oftentimes, that is because, or partially because of the words that come out of our mouths. Now, I'll switch it a little bit because you may be a little bit reluctant. Maybe this is your first time here and I'm already standing up in here and telling you that your words are wrong and that your words are getting you in trouble. So I'll say it a different way to maybe gain the, the skeptics or those who are not bought in. Here's another way that I, I think it can be said. Words spoken to you, you think back in time, some words spoken to you have shaped the world around you. And that can be good or bad. And I guarantee pretty much every single one of us in this room can think back to a time where something was said to us. Again, it could be a good thing. It can be an edifying thing from somebody that really mattered. And, and it was this compliment. It was like, whoa. And they spoke something into you that just gave you this confidence. And you have built upon that confidence ever since. Likewise... Possibly, more often, hopefully not, but probably, we can think back to a time where somebody said something negative in our lives. 
and it crushed us. And it changed the way that we see ourselves. It changed the way that we see our bodies. It changed the way that we see our abilities. And it's affected us ever since. Oftentimes it's something that goes all the way back to childhood that maybe a parent said. And maybe, maybe there was no real harmful intention behind it. But words spoken to you have shaped the world around you. Words are powerful. Now why am I driving home this point so much? Why, why am I just over and over and over saying these same things over these last few weeks? Because if you don't buy into the power of words, you'll lack the motivation to change. If you don't understand how powerful our words are, again, good or bad, and mostly we're talking about the negative sense. But if you don't buy into that, those, that power of those words, you're not going to have the motivation to change. You're not going to understand or believe that some of this chaos around you, some of the family or marital problems that you're having, is because of the words and the attitude that's behind those words. And we need to realize our words are deteriorating, killing our families, damaging our marriages, crushing the spirits of our kids, hurting our careers. And last but not least, our words water down our influence as followers of Jesus. Because we all can think back of a Christian who wasn't exactly speaking Christianese at the time. And we're like, that doesn't sound very Christian-like. Now, I'm not expecting anybody to be perfect. None of us are perfect. And I love that James, as we look in the book of James, if you've got your Bible, you can go ahead and start turning there to James chapter 3. But I love how James says, hey, we're not perfect. We're going to mess up. We're, 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 th we're going to struggle with this. But this is so important. So my title for today, no big surprise here, Taming the Tongue, Four Warnings, Part 2. Four Warnings, and this is Part 2. So last week we came up with a key statement. And this key statement is... If there is one thing we need to remember from these messages, this is it. Tame your tongue or inhibit what's important. Now, again, that word inhibit means to stop, to slow down, to hinder, to damage. You better learn how to tame your tongue or everything that's important to you in your life, you're going to mess it up. That's what that means. Tame your tongue or inhibit what's important. What you say and how you say it can, you, can determine your future over so many other factors. And remember, last week we gave that example of a career. And how in a career you can have all of the degrees, you can have the experience, you can look the part, you can have the pedigree, you can have everything that qualifies you for a job. And if you sit down for an interview and the interviewer starts asking you questions and is able to extrapolate some of you out of those answers, they're going to see in your words your attitude and your heart. And over all those other factors of your qualifications, that interviewer is probably going to say, I don't think this guy is a team player. I don't think she will fit in here well, or I think that he is just all about himself. We don't need that here on our team, no matter how qualified they are. Words are important. Words weigh heavier than pretty much anything else. And Jesus knows how important our words are. And, and this next verse here is our, our key verse for this series, and I referenced it earlier. Luke chapter 6, verses 45. 
It says, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. And then this, the, the big exclamation point on it right here. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And we say, no, 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 it just slipped out. Oh, I didn't mean to say that. And we come up with all these excuses. And Jesus would say, no, sorry. That's your heart. Your heart is showing. Is exactly what Jesus is saying here in Luke chapter 6. And in James chapter 1, before we get to chapter 3, James 1.26, we went over this verse last week. Here's kind of our, our anchor verse in James. It says, those who consider themselves religious, that just means a relationship with God, and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues, deceive themselves, and their religion, that relationship that they think that they have with God, their religion is worthless. That's a really big word. That word actually means vain, unreal, ineffectual, unproductive, and godless. So in James chapter 1, we said James just comes out of the gate swinging for the fences. He doesn't mess around with big introductions or any of that. He gets right down to the core of what he wants to say. And he drops this bomb in chapter, in chapter 1, verse 26... It says, those people who can't keep a tight rein, and he's going to go back to that reference here that we're going to look at in chapter 3. If you can't keep a tight rein on your tongue, that religion that you think you have, it's absolutely worthless. So chapter 2, he talks about what it is to you know, flesh out your faith, and then he gets into chapter 3, and he goes all in on the power of the tongue. So four warnings about the tongue. So real quickly, we go through one and two that we did last week. Number one, the tongue demonstrates power. The tongue demonstrates power. And, and we saw this example in that example of, of a job interview and going after a career. The tongue absolutely demonstrates power. And it can supersede all other things. But people will actually see your heart through the words that you say. And in Luke 6.45, it says, For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So James chapter 3, starting in verse 1, we'll just read it all the way through. It says, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Now, that's not a warning for people not to teach. It's a warning for people who are teaching or who do feel like they are called to teach to say, hey, you better take this seriously. Verse 2. He says, we all stumble in many ways. And again, I love that James said that. He's not expecting anybody to be perfect or to get this down perfectly. And he admits, we all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect or complete or whole. Able to keep their whole body in check. Now it's pretty interesting. Controlling a muscle in your body that weighs 0.15 pounds or two and a half ounces is the average weight of a tongue in case anybody was really curious about that. Controlling that is more difficult to do than controlling the rest of your body, James is saying here. It's pretty interesting. So four warnings about the tongue. Number one, the tongue demonstrates power. Number two, the tongue determines direction. And we've seen this already today. Verse three, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. The tongue determines direction. Remember we showed those pictures of those humongous ships? The Nock Nevis was 458 meters long, which is about 1,500 
feet long, I think it ended up being. And you see this massive ship in this big picture, and the rudder was, was just in the picture about this big compared to the rest of the ship. And James is saying, that's exactly what your tongue is. As small as it is, it will determine direction. It will determine where you go. So four warnings about the tongue. Number one, the tongue demonstrates power. Number two, the tongue determines direction. Now, the first two examples deal with direction. You know, the bit and the rudder. But then James, he, he changes gears a little bit here. And he's like, okay, maybe I'm not being strong enough or clear enough here. Here we go. Number three, the tongue delivers destruction. Destruction. It's not just about maybe changing the course of your life or, you know, it, it, yes, it's got some power in there. But he's like, okay, destruction will come from your tongue. Verse five, likewise... The tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Now, here's the change. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. How big is a, smart, a spark? Show me. How big is a spark? Like, I mean, you almost put your fingers together and that's it, right? And we think of a massive forest fire. It's all because of that one little spark. Because of one small thing. We're no strangers to forest fires here in Florida, are we? I got a, a notification. We were on vacation this week, and I got a notification that there was a brush fire on the side of the road, like mile marker 17 or something like that. So constantly, there's, just, there's fires everywhere. And in fact, in 2021, Florida had 2,262 wildfires. That's a lot of fires in one year. So in total, it burned 105,475 acres. It burned in Florida in 2021. And all of those 2,000 plus fires were started by a spark, a cigarette butt, a campfire that was left unattended, lightning, relatively, comparatively small things compared to 105,000 acres. Now, as many as that is, and, and me being a guy that kind of likes statistics, I had to see, okay, well, where is Florida? Is Florida the most? Because, I mean, that's a lot. Well, Florida, in fact, is not uh, the most or does not have the most forest fires. Uh, we're actually number 13, in case anybody was wondering. And who would be number one? California. I mean, we see it in the news all of the time. In 2000, uh, 2021, California had 9,280 wildfires. That's a lot of wildfires. Anybody want to guess how many acres were burned? A lot. No. Two million... 233,666 acres were burned in California in 2021 because of wildfires. Because they were started by something small. And that's exactly the point that James is trying to make here. All of those acres that were burned, they started from something small. And you will burn and you will destroy Things in your life because of one small slip up, we like to call it, that comes out of our mouths. Verse 6. He goes on, he says, the tongue also is a fire. Now it's like he's just like compounding and building on what he's saying, which, which also is a fire means it's able to destroy anything it touches. That's how powerful the tongue is. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. A world of evil. And then he gives us three very, very specific things. He says, it corrupts the whole body, 
sets the whole course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. Wow. Tell us how you really feel about the tongue, James. Don't hold back. But again, he wants us to understand how important this is. And I think it's interesting. I didn't plan it like this, but as I was studying this week, I was looking at it and I was like, that's our outline. That, that's three of our four points right there. It corrupts the whole body. The tongue demonstrates power. Sets the whole course of one's life on fire. The tongue determines direction. And is itself set on fire by hell. The tongue delivers destruction. Now, me being me, I, I looked at this last line. And is itself set on fire by hell. And I'm like, okay, what exactly does that mean? So, again, me being me, I read about 8 billion commentaries on this, and I got about 700 billion, 999 million answers, okay? Like, maybe one was repeated. There's a lot of different answers on what this could be. I boiled it down to two explanations of what I think this means, and I think they're both appropriate. They both fit for what James is trying to say. So two explanations. When he says, it is itself set on fire by hell, that word hell in the Greek is not the hell like we think of, like eternal damnation. The word that's actually used is Gehenna. Anybody know what Gehenna is? Gehenna is, um, it's actually a place in Israel, in Jerusalem. And if you go right to the edge of near where the old, the old town is, you can look over and down in this valley. It's actually the Valley of Hinnon, and they think that word was taken and kind of turned into Greek Gehenna. And in this valley, over thousands of years, just absolutely horrible, disgusting things have happened there. They had uh, child and adult sacrifices there uh, to the detestable god Moloch. Um, they were... They, dump all of their trash in there and they lit it on fire and so constantly day and night all of the time there was this smoldering trash dump it stunk it was nasty it was dirty it was thought to be a cursed land and as well it was also thought to be the entrance or kind of the connection between this world and the afterlife now, James isn't necessarily playing into believing that, but he's playing off of this thought of Gehenna. Your, your tongue is like from Gehenna. It's this detestable place that just has so much associated with it. It stinks, it's smoldering, it's smoking, it's burning, it's nasty, like, like horrible, detestable things have happened there, and it's basically the gate into hell. And that's what James is trying to say about our tongues. James, chill out, bro. But he wants us to get this point. He's driving this point home so much to get us to understand how important this is. So that's one explanation. I think James is trying to give probably the strongest description of evil that they could see in their minds. Because everyone thought of Gehenna, the Valley of Hinnon, as this detestable, disgusting, horrible place. ...that connects this world to hell. So I think that's what he was saying... ...but also I think this is appropriate too. And I wrote it like this. The negative, hurtful spewing of words from your mouth... ...is from and used by the enemy to do his will. I'll read it one more time. The negative, hurtful spewing of words from your mouth... ...is from... ...and used by the enemy to do his will. I think that is also what James is saying here. When you open up your mouth... ...and when your heart is full of evil, it's full of junk... ...and that makes its way through... ...you are allowing the enemy's will to happen. Destruction all around you. That's exactly what he wants. He's really only about three things, right? 
kill, steal, and destroy. That's what the enemy wants. And when that junk, in whatever form that it is, comes out of our mouth, we are doing the devil's bidding. So four warnings about the tongue. The tongue demonstrates power. The tongue determines direction. The tongue delivers destruction. And the fourth warning about the tongue, the tongue doesn't tame definitively. The tongue doesn't tame definitively. Now, what exactly does that word definitively mean? It means never definite. It's always going to be a struggle. It's always going to be a battle. Which we're like, okay, James, thanks a lot. Like, I thought you were going to give us some hope here. And now you're telling us, as bad as this is, we're always going to struggle with it. And James would go, yep. Yep. Exactly. That's exactly what I'm telling you. That you're always going to struggle with this. You're always going to be tempted because you are not a perfect person. You are always going to have some evil, some junk, some corrosion inside of your heart. And every once in a while, it's going to try to come up and slip out of your mouth. And that's what we've got to try to fix. We've got to do something about that. The tongue doesn't tame definitively. Verse 7. He says, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. Which, that, that verse fascinates me. Like, okay, we have like dolphin trainers now. Like, I mean, just theater of the sea. It's right in our backyard, right? I mean, you can go see a dolphin show, a sea lion show. They've like trained parrots and the parrots do things like I never knew parrots could do. Like, like they pick out different colors of things and all that blue truck, you know, right? And they do that. It's pretty cool. This is, I guess this is a commercial for theater to see. They're not paying me anything. They ought to. Okay. Um, but like we know how, okay, because we're in like 2023, we know how to train animals. And James is saying even back then, again, this has nothing to do with the sermon. I just think it's pretty cool. Like back then they were even tra training animals. Birds, reptiles, sea creatures, they're, they're, they're training all of those. They can tame them. But he goes on, verse 8. But no human being can tame the tongue. And it, like, like, I would be okay if he stopped there. But in James' fashion, which is really interesting now that I think of it. I didn't think of this before. We always talk about how Jesus, Jesus would like answer a question... And then he would go beyond and like give more. And it's funny, we see James doing this right here. It's like he took a cue from Jesus. He said, but no human being can tame the tongue, period. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Again, James is like, like it's that imagery of getting hit by a truck, right? And oh, sorry reverse I'm really sorry I did that right that's what that's what James is doing he is like reverse forward reverse forward backing up and going forward over us to get us to understand this so what's our key statement what's the one thing that we have to understand what is the thing that reason why I've now taken three weeks to basically say the same thing just in creative, different ways. Thank you, James. To get us to understand. Tame your tongue or inhibit what's important. Those important things in your life. The things that matter most to you. If you want them to stay good. Or maybe, maybe they're not good right now. And maybe it is because of your tongue. Tame your tongue or inhibit what's important. Four warnings about the tongue. The tongue demonstrates power. The tongue determines direction. The tongue delivers destruction. And the tongue doesn't tame definitively. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at the source of our tongues. 
we're going to move about 17 inches from right here down to here. And we're going to figure out what it is. Why? Why do we have this junk built up inside of us? What is in there that causes all of that mess to come out of our mouths? And what we can do about it. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your love and your grace. Thank you, God, that although we have messed up so many times, that, God, we have allowed our tongues and our mouths and our language to get us in so much trouble. Sometimes, God, we even use our tongues to curse you. But God, in your mercy and in your grace, you've forgiven us. You've already forgiven us. Thank you, God, for that forgiveness. Thank you, God, for second, third, and one millionth chances. God, your mercy never ends. It's new every morning, and I'm so grateful for that, God. God, help us as we struggle with our tongues. Help us, God, as we navigate through this life and, and, and facing different challenges, facing different pains and different hardships and just different junk in our lives, God. As we do these things, God, it is such a temptation to allow our hearts to be impure and our mouths to just let it out. God, help us in that. Help us to navigate through this life. Thank you again, God, that you are a grace-filled God. And thank you, God, that we are in a grace-filled church. And God, I pray for those here this morning who do not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, who have not started a true relationship with you that we talk about all the time. Right now in this moment, would they say, God, I give you my life. Lord, would you save me, change me? I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And he rose again three days later, defeating death, defeating sin, defeating the grave. Heads are still bowed, eyes are closed. If you've said that this morning for the first time, if you want to start a relationship with Jesus, I'd love to know about it. I'm not going to call you out or cause any commotion, but I'd just love to pray for you. Would you just slip your hand up and say, I got it right today. I started a relationship with Jesus today. Thank you. Jesus, thank you again that you are good, as we sang earlier, that you turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies and seas into highways because you are the only one that can. Thank you, God, that you change lives. That you don't just make bad things good, that you bring dead things to life. And that is the God that we serve. We thank you, Lord, and we just pray that you would bless this time of offering Use it, God, in an amazing way so that we can bless this community and bless this world. God, help us to be generous because you have been so generous to us. We pray all of this in your awesome, amazing name, the name of Jesus. Amen.